Good morning, everybody. How are you today? I am excited to start this new Bible study with you. I'm trying to get my camera set up right. Oh, goodness. This is exciting. I'm excited. And also, I can tell that the enemy's not excited about us studying Called to Rain. We're starting our brand new study this week. Called to Rain is our book. You can get it at Amazon and ChristianBook.com. You may be experiencing a little delay with getting your books. Um, I believe, based on what I'm hearing at my work, uh, UPS, FedEx are experiencing Christmas time sized orders, volume of orders, and so there's some delay in receiving books. So if you um, haven't had a chance to order your book, you might want to get download the Kindle. Or go ahead and order the book if you just have to have that book in your hand. I'm enjoying having the book in my hand and underlining. But hey, Kindle gives us that opportunity too. I hope that you will share things that you're learning from the study in the group. That you'll encourage us with the quotes that you are highlighting and the revelations God has given you. This is packed with revelation. I'm so grateful that this man, the author, Leif Hetland, decided to give us, uh, pour out the revelation God has been giving him about being not an orphan in this life, but being a daughter of the King, a daughter of the Most High God, this beautiful privilege of being belonging to God and what that looks like, what it really looks like and how how rooted and grounded in his love we can be instead of always trying to earn his love. So convicting for me, so convicting for me because, um, I mean, Hey, I grew up in church. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church and I, I just haven't always understood. I, I still, I'm, this book is convicting. It is helping me get the truth into me at a deeper level. And it's not that I haven't heard the truth all my life. It's that there have been some mental blocks to receiving the truth for whatever reason. We all have an enemy. So before I start teaching, which I'm winding up to do, I think we should pray. Y'all ready to pray? Lord, I come to you in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. So grateful that because of Jesus, we are welcomed into your family as daughters, welcomed, um, not having to earn the right anymore to stand before you, not having to hide from you when we feel that we have done wrong or know that we have done wrong or uh, are ashamed of something, but that we can come boldly into your throne to, to receive your love, to receive your help, to receive the direction, the redirection that we need. And so, Lord, we are humbling ourselves before you today to learn what it is we need to know that we don't know, to, to be filled with your truth and to let that truth do its work, the healing and delivering work. I thank you, Lord, that you are more powerful than every lie that has ever come against our souls. I thank you that you have warring angels to help us. I thank you that you are the wonderful counselor I thank you that we have access to you. I thank you that we can have wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And that is what we want. We want to know you. We want to know you. We want to know how you know us and what you think about us when, when you think about us. We want to be rooted and grounded in your love for those roots to go deep, deep, deep into the truth about you and not some partial truth, not some lie. We want our hearts to be open in a new way so the ground of our heart can be cultivated. So new crops of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and self-control and humility and all of those beautiful things, the blessings of being yours, Lord, Lord, that they would come forth from us, but first just that we would soak in that truth that that's where we live already. Thank you, Lord, that you open the eyes of our hearts today. You open our spiritual ears and that we are ready receivers by your grace to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, we just ask for your hand of blessing to be upon each one of the ladies 
involved in the study watching right now and um, in the days to come when they watch the replays. We want to be We want to be rested in you, resting in you. And I thank you for this truth that will help us do that in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, ladies, good morning. I see a few of your faces, Cheryl and Janet and Penny. And I think that's Priscilla. Great to see you. All right. So we're going to kick this off. First of all, I want to remind you that we have prayer this afternoon at 430. We have a new prayer time tomorrow at 6.30 in the morning. These are central times, 6.30 tomorrow morning, and then again on Friday at 11.55 or right about noon, and we want to pray for you, so post your prayer requests in the group. You'll find a few places to do that. We'll find you. Tag me if you need to, to make sure we find your prayer requests, but we want you to join us there because praying together. There's so much power in that. There's so much love that happens when we, when we pray for somebody else. And it's done my heart so good to be um, praying with my sisters. It's iron sharpening iron to, to hear their prayers and to, to feel their faith in their prayers. And, and it's just been a beautiful thing for me. And I want to invite you into it. Okay, so that was for our announcements. The, we're starting the study today, the Called to Reign study, Living and Loving from a Place of Rest. And I am uh, teaching from chapters, the introduction in chapters one and two today. Then you can read this week those chapters, take notes, study, process it, chew on it. And then next week, Kathy will come and teach from chapters three and four, introducing it to you, and then you'll read and reprocess it, keep tilling the soil of your heart and your mind, and um, to let these truths sink in. So I hope you have something to write with. I'm going to give you some scriptures that I want you to hang your hat on this week to pray about. So first of all, we want to start with um, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. While you're getting something to write those down, I wanted to back right on up to conviction. This book is convicting and thank God that it is. We need conviction. I hope you are praying for a spirit of conviction in your life because we need it. And the Lord gave me the sweetest revelation of what that looks like. One of our friends in this group started reading the book and she posted that it was so convicting yet so full of hope. And that's exactly, I couldn't have phrased that any better. Um, it is convicting toward hope. I love flowers. I plant flowers. I've really been doing more gardening this uh, spring and summer than I have in the past. And um, my mom gave me some little shoots of a plant that were just springing up around where it was planted. The seeds had fallen and little shoots were coming up. And so she gave them to me. I put them in one of those little six packs like you get the bedding plants at a nursery. And um, I, I put some in a little, some round ones too. Okay, so I still have some of them in those little bedding plant containers. And then I planted two of them in my flower bed in the front of the house. The ones in the front of the house that have been planted, that their roots have been able to go deep, deep, deep into the soil, good soil that is fertilized and nourished and where the sun can hit them, they are waist high or higher. And there are so many beautiful, it's not a flower, it's kind of, it's called a prince's feather and it's like a little plume that comes out of it. I'll put pictures in the group after the study. But so it's, it is waist high. Okay. So like two and a half, three feet tall, the ones that are still in the little bedding plant containers, they're about this high, maybe a little higher this high. And they get shriveled up because I forget to water them because the amount of soil they have is about this wide and about this deep. I haven't planted them. And so they haven't grown they are still sitting in on my patio. They're not getting direct sunlight, which obviously they need. And so it's such a, a beautiful picture of conviction. If we allow conviction to come and uproot us, uproot lies that we believe, uproot actions that we have been 
uh, doing that aren't good for us, that don't line up with the beautiful, rich and abundant life that the Lord has given us, then we stay small and life stays small. And if we allow ourselves to be planted into righteousness, into the righteousness of Christ, if our roots go down deep into his love, then we we have this bigger life with more fruit to show the world who God is, to reveal his glory in the individuality of ourselves. Ha, I have this great revelation right here in my back patio in my front yard of exactly what this study is doing for us, of what any Bible study is going to do for us. So back to the scripture, we're going to start with Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. And I'm reading from the um, Passion Translation, all of these scriptures I'm going to give you, except for Jeremiah. Okay, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. We've got roots and we've got resting place and we've got love and we've got faith in the life of Christ, in his righteousness. And that's what this study is going to do for us. If we will allow the conviction, if we will read these words, if we will talk to God about these words, if we'll pray them, have conversations with him about them, then we will flourish in exactly what we're meant to be and do. And, and fear will fall away. Fear of not being enough. Fear of not knowing what we're supposed to do. Um, or fear of, of just being, being wrong on the inside. Fear of just not being loved. Not being kept. Not being safe. All those things women really worry about. So... Ephesians 3, 17, how would you pray that? How would you talk to the Lord about that? I'm going to read it to you again. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you. Lord, I want to use my faith. Let me exercise my faith. I want to hear the words that are truth and, and exercise, let my faith grow from those words because faith comes by hearing. So I want my faith to go down deep into the love of Christ, the life of Christ and what Christ did for me. And, and that is something I'm praying about. I want to understand the gospel for myself. I don't want to be busy trying to teach the gospel, preach the gospel, or bring people to Christ if I am deficient in understanding it for myself. If I am hiding parts of myself that don't feel pleasant or good or acceptable to God, and I'm out there trying to help somebody else know the love of God, I'm, I'm going to be deficient in the love of God if I'm not grasping, if I'm not rooted and grounding, grounded in it. And then Lord, I want to rest in that love. I want to be rooted like a tree, like that righteous oak. I want to be rooted so that when the winds of the world blow against me and, um, difficult things come my way that I may sway. I may bend. I may fall a little bit. I'm not going to break. I am rooted and grounded deep in your love. So the next scripture I want us to look at is Romans 14, 17. And again, this is the passion. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but it is the realm of of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but it is the realm of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. How would you pray this? I want to understand the, the realities of the freedom I have in Christ. I want to, I want to experience the righteousness of Christ, the peace of Christ and the joy of Christ. Now you have the Holy Spirit living in you. I have the Holy Spirit living in me. All of the spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. So righteousness, peace, and joy, they are living deep inside you already. They are there. They are implanted love is implanted in you everything you need for life and godliness 
is yours in your account. It's in there. Now, if we're not experiencing it, then we've got to dig deep. We've, we've got to trust that it's there. We've got to drink from the river of life, that fountain of life that is always flowing by the Holy Spirit in our life. And so what I'm learning to do is if I'm not at peace, if I'm real anxious, I'm stopping and I'm saying, the Prince of Peace is mine. The Prince of Peace wanted me, chose me. The Prince of Peace, the government of my life rests on his shoulders. I don't have to be anxious for anything, but peace lives in me. And I'm calling that peace up to take to take root here. I'm calling up the joy of the Lord. I am commanding my soul to sing the joy of the Lord. I am embedded in the beauty of the righteousness of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. So think through how you would pray and how you would declare these words, these truths about your life. Okay. Jeremiah 2 13 says, and this is new living because we don't have the passion translation yet for Jeremiah, or at least I don't, I haven't found it for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now he's talking about his people that belong to him have done two evil things. They have abandoned the fountain of living water and they've gone and built for themselves something else that will not provide the way that he can provide. Now he's the fountain that you just keep going to for more. And when we pray, we're going to that fountain for more life, for more godliness, for more understanding, for for the richness of that abundant life that he has given us for understanding, for counsel, for guidance, for safety, all those things that we go to him for. He is constantly, you know, the beautiful fountains that you see, they just keep pouring. That's the beauty of them. They just splash and, and, and it's beautiful to watch, but they don't stop. So we can forsake, abandon going to that fountain for what we need. And then we, as his people, can go dig for ourselves cisterns that are cracked that don't hold water. So we're digging. First of all, we're working to provide for ourselves. We're working to um, build our own castle, to build our own kingdom. We're doing instead of being. And we're working instead of receiving. And the fact is, they're cracked cisterns. They're not going to hold water. Remember the Israelites, they received manna every day, but not enough for tomorrow. And they weren't to hoard it because if they did, then it would be ruined the next day. But they always had enough. And, and that's what he's saying here. You can go, you can go hoard some things. You can go build your own thing and, and try to make yourself look strong and beautiful and, um, worthy of people's attention, but I am the place you're going to get all of those needs met. So in praying that we can ask for conviction to know where our cracks, where we're putting all of our energy into crack cisterns that will not give us rest and will not be enough for us. Where have we forsaken the fountain of living water? Where are we going to, to get something that's not going to satisfy Okay, Psalm 119, 132 says, Help me turn my eyes away from illusions so that I pursue only that which is true. Drench my soul with life as I walk in your paths. Drench my soul with life as I walk in your paths, the rich and abundant life, everything we need for life and godliness, life here on earth, life today, and life for eternity, everything we need. So how would you pray? Psalm 119, help me turn my eyes away from illusions. Help me turn my eyes away from cracked cisterns. Help me turn my eyes away from lies that are driving my restlessness, that are driving my anxiety, that 
lies that are driving my uh, addiction, that is driving my sense of discon un discontentment, yes, dissatisfaction and discontentment. So we, we can be living a life, a deluded life, hmm. deluded. We have a fountain that is saturating and we can be, we have lies that delude or uh, dilute or, or even just poison us with things that are not of God in our thoughts, which drive our behavior. These are verses that you're not going to, only one of these verses, I believe you'll find in these chapters, but the Holy Spirit had me um, bring this to you to introduce what we're going to, what we want as we read these chapters. Everything I believe that he's saying in this book is the truth and biblical, but let the Holy Spirit lead you, guide you in those things. Ask for, ask for truth, ask for red flags if you need them. But we want to be praying the truth. We want to let the truth guide us. And that's what I want you to get out of this study is the truth. And so these four scriptures, they're in, in the description of today's video and they'll be in the email that I'll send out later. So one of the things that he talks about, and I believe it's in chapter two, is having a truth deficiency. Now he is talking about um, Satan and why Satan fell. Satan was a worship leader and Satan was not satisfied with his position. He didn't believe, whatever, you'll read about it. But Satan is not only did he fall because he had a truth deficiency and a self problem, but he is perpetuating that in this world today. He's the prince of the power of the air, but he does not prevail. And we have spiritual authority and the truth triumphs over his lies. And so we do not have to live with a truth deficiency. That is his game. He is the father of lies and the word triumphs over his lies. And that's what we want. So the, tr what, um, the profound thing that the author of the book brought out is that if we have a truth deficiency, then we have a love deficiency. And then if we have a love deficiency, we have a blessing deficiency. Let that sink in for a minute. If we're deficient in the truth, then we will be deficient in receiving God's love and being love. And if we are deficient in receiving, comprehending, um, resting in his love, then we will be missing out on the blessings of his love. It will affect what we pray about. It will affect what we ask him for. It will affect um, our relationships and the blessings we want from being in relationship from somebody or we long for because of the love deficiency. And the love is going to be deficient if the truth is deficient. So Praise the Lord for the truth. And there is a lot of truth that we want to soak in, in this book. So I'm trying to decide where to go from here. One of the concepts that he brings out in the book is our chairs. And he wants you to see your, see that there are three chairs that we could be sitting in in life. So one chair is uh, the kingdom of God. The second chair is the kingdom of self. And the third chair is the kingdom of Satan or being lost. So, and he says the church, you know, is living in these first two chairs, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of self. And a lot of the church is focused on um, the church, the body of Christ, us as individuals are focused on self and that's because we are deficient of the truth about God. So I want to go over these things he brings out about the chair number one and the chair number two, and we're going to line them up. This is maybe the most important thing you can do for yourself as you read, take notes about chair one, what happens in chair one and what happens in chair two. And 
There's a cheat sheet for you on page 320, which is the very last page of the book. And it just gives you a little chair one, chair two, all these things. So you can see the difference in living as a much loved child of God or living in the kingdom of self, more focused on self and trying to earn the love of the Lord. So I'm going to read them to you and then I'm just going to let you study them. I scrolled too far. Hold on just a sec. Okay, so in chair one, we it's a be, a have, and a do. We, we live in this place of being a child of God, having every spiritual blessing, all that our, all our needs are supplied. And then from those, that progression, being, having, and doing, then we fulfill our assignments, our destiny on this earth. So in chair one, we are rooted in the spirit of sonship or daughtership. We have, we experience God's pleasure without having to perform. He says that you already have an A plus on your report card. Do you believe that? I'll be honest with you. I struggle to believe it. I'm constantly checking if I am being approved of by God. And that is ridiculous. And it is a truth deficiency. And I am committed to getting past it. We live from, in the chair one, we live from a place of total acceptance and rest. Total acceptance and rest. Um, we know that we are the habitation, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We hear the Father's voice as a son or a daughter and trust that he is able to guide us. He is able to help us. He is the performer and he is able to guide us. Then we know that we belong, so we believe God's promises. We are rooted in the sonship or the daughtership, and so we believe and we trust Him, and we believe all these promises are true for us, and we're not doubting them. <clears throat> and we behave as we are called to behave because all of those things are driving our behavior. Excuse me, just a second. So in chair one, we know who we are. We live from our inheritance and we walk out our destiny. But we see it as an assignment, not the thing that's going to validate us. Now, in chair two, scrolling from my notes, we're trying to believe the right way in order to behave the right way in order to belong. We're always trying to become something because we are forgotten or don't know our true identity. Like the disciples that wanted to call down judge, we are like the disciples that wanted to call down judgment on the Samaritan town, which means we're lacking love and mercy and not understanding God's heart. You don't, uh, you want to be separate from the world because you're afraid you're going to be corrupted by it. You're rooted in fear, which is sometimes disguised in a vocabulary of love. You're not motivated by love, but by fear. You're serving to become someone significant, not as a son or a daughter. You're working for God, but always thinking about yourself. And you know how to get from earth to heaven. You know how to do that. You said yes to Jesus. You know how to get to heaven but you're not sure how to bring heaven to earth. So that is what he refers to as being an orphan or thinking like an orphan or an orphan spirit. And it's an, a very important thing for us to address, a very important conviction to let come over us to not to shame us, not to say, Jennifer White, you're 51 years old. You've been in church your whole life. And why haven't you gotten it yet? I don't believe that's what God's saying. That's what I say to myself sometimes. But I don't believe that's God's heart, heart toward me. But if you think about an orphan, this is, this is the vision of the imagery that I had when I was thinking through this. You've seen the movies where the orphan is getting dressed up to be presented to the potential parents and they want to look right, and they want to talk right, and maybe there's an, someone there at the orphanage 
is desperate to get them out of the way so they can have more room from the next person. And so they're encouraged to say the right things, to be the right things, and to hopefully be chosen because they did all the right things. And that's how we can act by act in our relationship with God is to be trying to do all the right things to be chosen. And, um, and we're already chosen. We were chosen from the beginning of time. We are dearly loved chosen daughters who are set apart to Christ. And I'm rehearsing that a lot because it's obviously something that, um, I'm, I'm dealing with. So he brings out the point that orphans can be religious or rebellious or legalistic or just, you know, full out uninhibited in sin, not able to stop legalistic or lawless, self-righteous or struggle with sin, either one, but either both are, are prisons. They're like living in that little plastic bedding plant, um, container instead of being planted in my yard and bearing beautiful fruit. And again, all of this is not to shame you for like not being there yet. It's not to make you feel pressed down that, gosh, I haven't gotten it. It's to, it's to say, Lord, break me out of this prison of this bedding plant container and plant me in the truth, in that good, rich soil of the truth. So I'm not deficient in the way I understand your love and I'm not deficient in the way I understand my inheritance. And so I'm not deficient in fulfilling the assignments that you have for me here. So I want you to think about what well, you've probably already thought about narcissists. Um, the world's talking about narcissists a lot. I've thought a lot about them myself and done some research. And there's a term that toxic people there's a term of, of that describes the way a toxic person um, tries to deceive the person in their other person in their life. It's called gaslighting, and there was a movie about it way a long time ago called Gaslight. And in the movie, um, there was someone in charge of uh, turning the gas lit lamps, lanterns up up and down because they didn't have electricity, and so the person who owned the house or lived there, kept saying, oh, you changed the light. And the person who was in charge of changing the light would say, no, I didn't change it. And so over time, that continual lie, he was, he was changing the light and she was seeing it, but because he was lying about it and saying, no, that's not true. That's not reality. You're seeing things. I haven't changed it she began to question her reality and believe his lies, but, but she was seeing this, but she was hearing this and she went crazy because of it. A narcissist will work to make you question your reality. Now, narcissism and people who are narcissists are not our focus today. What I'm trying to, what I want you to understand is that is a scheme of the enemy. It started with him. He has been lying to you about the realities of God's love from the beginning, generations before you. And in many different ways, subtle ways, and in very uh, traumatic ways, like bursts of evil or little bitty subtle, just like the gas lighter in this movie where he was saying, no, that's not reality. It's what he did to Eve. And I can't wait for you to read about that in the first couple of chapters in the way um, Eve was duped into what he said. He questioned her and tried to make her believe she didn't have what she already had. And, And that is making us question our reality. The Bible tells us what our reality is. God tells us we are loved. We are his daughter. Jesus paid the price to bring us back into fellowship, into relationship, to kick the enemy's tail. And we live in this high position, in this royal place, 
in the family of God where all of our needs are met. But there is an enemy who is gaslighting us constantly. And we have to fight back. We have to fight back with the truth. And that's what this study is going to do. And that's what has happened in this author's life. He's very honest about, hey, he had to have this revelation because he was living out these lies. He was had a truth deficiency, but the Lord baptized him in love. And that is my prayer for you today, that you and I would be baptized in the love that starts with the truth. And, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we just show up. We show up for the light. We show up to let our roots grow down deep in his love. And he does the rest. And we just keep saying, I want to cooperate with you. I want to cooperate with the truth. I want the truth, not the lies. And we have to tell ourselves the truth constantly. He's the high priest of our confession. And so we just keep confessing the truth. And we can confess the truth about where we miss it, not and, and not expect to get hit or just, you know, that his eyes aren't turned toward us anymore, but to just be say, okay, great. I'm ready to put you take, you know, you know where the word says your boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. Well, that plant in my front yard, the boundary lines for it have fallen in very pleasant places and the packaged one in the back patio, the boundary lines are pretty small, pretty tight. And we're, we're going to live that front yard living <laughs> where we have plenty of sun and great soil. And um, whatever that means for you today, I just pray that the Lord is bringing revelation to you through it. The, one, the last thing I want to say to you is um, as you read this book and consider living from that place of rest and that place of uh, being loved in that place of blessing, I want you to think about the Good Samaritan. Remember there, the, in the story of the Good Samaritan, three people passed by this wounded person. And two of one was a priest and one was a Levite. And um, they, were, they, they signify religion, okay? They're, they're legalistic, religious, busy doing things for God people. The other one stopped and helped and paid for whatever needed to be done for the person who was wounded. Now, Jesus has done that for me and you. He stopped. He paid the price. He took care of us. It, the word says his ministry is binding up our wounds. And so it, it's, it's not a problem to have a wound. That the Lord knows there's an enemy and he knows what his scheme against you has been. He's there to bind up our wounds. So being honest with the Lord about the wounds is cool. It's a very cool. You can bring it before him and, um, and have a, a smorgasbord table of truth with him. You know, just sit and talk about the truth, tell him everything. And he's there to bind them up. But I also want to encourage you to be the daughter of the Most High God who stops and takes care of herself, who stops for the wounded part of you and, and deals with it. Instead of being, I got to push this to the back, this thing that's happened to me, this problem I'm having in my mind, this problem I'm having in my marriage, this problem I'm having with whatever it is, and just churning, churning, moving forward to make sure that you get that thing done for God, to make sure that you do that thing that validates who you are to God. But don't be duped into thinking you don't have, you, you can't take time to deal with that thing that's working against you or that, that really hurts. Be the good Samaritan to yourself. Stop and, and deal with it. Stop and let the word wash over you. Take time away. Take a break. Go on a retreat. Take however many hours you want to. Like instead of a spa day, have a word day. Do that for yourself. I've been doing that more for myself and it's paying off. And I'm not there yet. I mean, I am there yet. I'm a daughter of the Most High God. But there's still things that I have to deal with. 
or, or be honest with God about. And the more I am, the more free I'm being getting. And it's a beautiful, beautiful process. I've talked way too long. I love you. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for me for this study. Dig in, girls. Don't miss it. Don't let the busyness keep you from this truth. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the blessings. And I thank you, Lord, that you're working mightily by the power of your word, that as we cooperate with your truth, as we come back to the fountain of living water, as we stop from building cisterns that are cracked, Lord, that you just show us, you show us, you reveal the truth to us where we are working and exhausting ourselves in a in a way that's not working for us, that's not bringing forth fruit. We know that you are our healer. You are the provider of every good thing we need, and you are our healer. And so we just submit ourselves to you today. We want to stand firm in the truth of our reality. We want to be bold, have eyes to see where we're being gaslit by the enemy where we are, uh, where he is denying the truth of our reality. We want to be bold back about the truth to him. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing right here. And I thank you that you see on the other side of what you're about to do and that it is good and beautiful and free and lovely. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving my friends. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. God bless you girls. See you soon. Bye.